Last week we began our walk through the first letter of the Apostle Peter. And we looked at just the first two verses, Peter's opening salutation, his address to the churches. And we saw in those verses what our identity is in Jesus Christ. As a Christian, this is who you are. You are the elect, the chosen of God. You are a stranger. You're an alien in this world, someone who is passing through a land that is not your own on your way to your true home. As a Christian, you have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God into sanctification by his Holy Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for cleansing by his blood. Today we will go on to discover what we have received and what we will receive from God through faith in Jesus Christ. But before we do that, I want you to notice something very important. I hope that you have your Bibles open to 1 Peter chapter 1, and if not, get there quickly. Look at those opening verses once again. They're on the screen. Notice that God, in the fullness of his personality, is at work in the life of every Christian. That is to say that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit is at work in your life. You have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. It was God the Father who decided to choose you. You have been chosen through and for the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. It is the Spirit of God who draws you, who convicts you of your sin, who indwells you at the point when you surrender in faith to Christ, who then equips you and makes you fit for service. All of that is the work of the Holy Spirit. And you are chosen and you are set apart for obedience to Jesus Christ the Son and for cleansing by his shed blood, which he accomplished through his finished work on the cross. The triune God is bound together in the work of your salvation. I said previously, it takes all three persons of the Godhead just to save you. Beginning with foreknowledge and election, all the way through obedience, cleansing, and sanctification, God the three working together as one, for God in his three revealed persons is one. And the end result of the Father's election, this is you, is an obedient and cleansed servant of Jesus Christ who is equipped and set apart by the Holy Spirit for sacred service. Now, Peter begins to tell these Christians and to tell us through the word what they have received from God through their faith in Jesus Christ and then what they will receive from him. We're at verse 3. And I'll ask you to stand in honor of the reading of God's word. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead into an inheritance 
that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine. I'm going to say that again. These trials have come so that your faith may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with inexpressible and glorious joy for you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Amen? Amen? Let's pray together. God, we thank you for this word, first written many years ago by Peter to churches in Asia Minor. But now, this text is before us. It is your inspired word. And your Holy Spirit is present with us as we've gathered in Jesus' name. And it is our experience and the promise of Scripture that if we will open our hearts to the Word and to the work of the Holy Spirit, you will take this Word and you will drive it deep in our hearts and you will change our thinking. And so change our behavior. And God, we don't want to walk out of here the same way we came in. As we experience the presence of the living Christ, we want to be transformed. Yes. Do that work in us today, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you, and you may be seated. All right, first Peter begins to talk about our past by mentioning the new birth. As a Christian, if you are a Christian, you have received new birth. Peter begins by inviting us to bless and praise God with him, for we have received from God's mercy... A new birth. Quite literally, he says, let us praise the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who, according to his great mercy, has regenerated us into a living hope by means of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The source of your life in Christ is God himself. He is the one who regenerates us, who gives us new life through a new birth. He gives it out of his great mercy. In other words, we desperately needed it and couldn't do anything about it. And so in his mercy, he did this for us as a gift. And all we have to do is by faith receive it. Now I don't need to explain the new birth to most of you. Because you understand it and you're living in it. But it is a constant source of amazement to me how many people don't understand it. And a source of frustration to me that so many church leaders don't even teach it anymore. I think I've told this story before, but don't worry, I'm going to tell it again. <laughs> I had a conversation one time with a friend of mine. He was pastor of the church right down the street in our small village. 
And um, I, of course, was at the Baptist church, and he was at a church of another denomination, Protestant denomination. And we were good friends. And he was saying to me one time that we Baptists make too much of this born-again thing. He said, you take that one conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus and you make it the pattern for all Christians. And he went on to explain his thinking that some folks come to faith suddenly and so they have a radical conversion experience, but others, like children, are raised in the faith and They've known about Jesus and loved Jesus their whole life. And so they never really have an experience of conversion. And he concluded, I think incorrectly, that there are some Christians who are the born-again type. And other Christians who are not the born-again type. But we're all still Christians nonetheless. Interesting perspective. I certainly agree that conversion experiences vary from person to person and we can't press everybody into the same mold as far as their experience is concerned. But as far as I see in scripture, there is no such thing as a Christian who is not born again. Friends, that's what a Christian is. A Christian is a person who has placed their faith in the saving work of Jesus Christ and who as a result of that faith have received the Holy Spirit. And the coming of the Holy Spirit into your life is what the Bible calls regeneration. Amen. New birth. Amen. And this is the clear teaching of Scripture. Jesus said in that conversation with Nicodemus in John 3, you must be born again. And must means it is necessary. And he wasn't just talking about this Pharisee. He was talking to us all. He called it being born of the Spirit. And he also said, unless a person be born again, he or she cannot enter the kingdom of God. I don't know how to say it any clearer than that. John wrote in the first chapter of his gospel, but as many as received Christ, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. You're not a child of God until you become a child of God. And you become a child of God by receiving and believing in Christ. He gave the right to become children of God. Children who are born not of blood nor of the will of the flesh nor of the will of man. But who are born of God. You have to be born of God. Born of the Spirit in order to become a child of God. Paul said it this way. If any man be in Christ, they're a new creation. The old has gone. Behold, all things are new. James said it this way. The Father chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. I'm not going to go into explaining that, but he said the Father gave us birth. Praise God. Amen. And again, this is Peter, not here, but later in the same chapter. You have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable seed through the living, enduring word of God. Now, it's enough for me that if Jesus said something, that's true. And I don't need to look anywhere else. But when Jesus said something, and then John said the same thing, and then Paul, and then James, and then Peter... That makes me sit up and pay attention. 
This is the thorough teaching of the New Testament. Our experience of conversion may vary, but all who are truly Christian are born-again Christians. By God's great mercy, he has regenerated us into a living hope by means of the resurrection of Christ Jesus from the dead. Now let's talk about the Christian's future. Peter talks about our past by referring to the new birth. He talks about our future by referring to our inheritance. As a Christian, our spiritual rebirth leads directly into our inheritance. And our inheritance is heaven and eternal life. And into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed at the last time. Now this is a beautiful picture. When we are born again by the Spirit, we become children of God. Spiritually, we are not God's children until we've been born of God through receiving Jesus Christ by faith. People say, well, we're all God's children. Not so. We're all God's creation. But we're not all God's children. You're not a child of God until you become a child of God through faith in Jesus Christ. But the moment we enter into this father-child relationship, we are instantly heirs of all that our Father has in store for us. If you're a child of God, you're an heir. And Paul writes this very thing in Romans 8. The Spirit himself testifies to our spirit that we are God's children now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. God is our heavenly father. And when we accept Jesus Christ, we become children of God and joint heirs with Jesus, our older brother. Everything that God gave to him upon his resurrection, he also has in store for us. We have waiting for us in heaven an inheritance which Peter says is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. Now, I wonder what aspect of your inheritance you are looking forward to the most. Rest from earthly labor? Seeing loved ones who have gone on before? The absence of all things sinful and corrupt? As I get older, and I think there are a lot of people like me, I'm looking forward to that new body. <laughs> Freedom from pain and disease. But most of all, I think just being in the very presence of Jesus the Savior will be enough for me. This inheritance, Peter says, is imperishable. That means that it cannot be destroyed. It also means that it cannot be captured or taken away from us. No one can rob you of your inheritance in Christ. The book of Genesis, we read of Jacob stealing his brother Esau's blessing, which was the promise of his inheritance. No one can destroy your inheritance and no one can steal it away from you. Our inheritance is undefiled, and that word simply means it's unspotted, unspoiled by sin. It is pure, it is unpolluted. There is no sin, no evil, not even sadness in heaven. And our inheritance is unfading. It will never lose its brilliance, never lose its value, and it will last forever. But let me tell you something that's really great. 
about your inheritance. Perhaps the best thing. You ready? It's already yours. Now, when we think of an inheritance, we think about some property that we're going to take possession of someday. We are heirs now, but we won't receive our inheritance of eternal life until some later date. Indeed, not until the revelation of Jesus Christ at the last day will we receive all that God has for us. But here's the thing. As far as God is concerned... When we come to faith in Jesus Christ, our inheritance is ours as a present possession. The word inheritance carries in it the meaning of that which is a future hope, but that which is also a present possession. Because if God has promised you eternal life, that promise is as good as his word. And therefore, because God is true and never breaks his promises, eternal life is already yours. In God's eyes. I promised it. I'll never go back on my promise. So that which you are awaiting is yours as a present possession. Indeed, John writes, you have already passed out of death into life. Your second birth, given to you by God's mercy when you trusted Christ, secured your place in God's spiritual family as one of his children, And when you became his child, you became his heir. God is keeping your inheritance safe for you in heaven. And he is protecting you and shielding you by his Holy Spirit. And eternal life is already yours as a future inheritance and as your present possession. All right, let's talk about the Christian's presence. This is not only our experience, but this is the clear teaching of Scripture. Your past is a new birth. Your future is an inheritance. What is your present? Grief and trials. Not a great answer. You are hoping for better, but that's our experience, isn't it? And it's the clear teaching of the Word of God. In the midst of this word of praise to God for giving us rebirth and an inheritance, our past and our future, Peter speaks about the ongoing trials of the present. He's only six verses into his sermon And Peter shows us that he is well aware of the severe trials being faced by his brothers and sisters in Christ. In this you greatly rejoice for your rebirth, your hope, your inheritance. Though now, for a little while, you may have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. And these have come, so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. These Christians in Asia Minor that Peter was writing to were living in a world that was hostile to them because of their faith, The same as we are today. But they were living through the storm of persecution which was breaking out over them and Christians in Peter's day were already beginning to die for their faith. And here we have briefly in just two verses a strategy or a recipe for endurance when life is hard and trials come. Peter reminds us 
of three reasons here in this passage why we can stand anything that may come upon us. So, a recipe for enduring trials, number one, look forward to what's coming. Look forward to what's coming. First, they can stand anything, we can stand anything, because we are able to see what we're looking forward to, to know what we're looking forward to. Peter's already told them about their eternal inheritance, waiting for them in heaven. But he also mentions the salvation ready to be revealed at the last day. And he talks about this revelation or the appearance of Jesus Christ. He's telling these Christians, you can endure what you're going through right now because you have a living hope. You have assurance of salvation. You can look forward to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And when we know we can look forward to these things, we can get through what we're going through today. For the Christian, persecution and trouble, though severe, is not the end. In fact, in the light of eternity, it lasts only a little while. The 70, 80 years that we're promised in Scripture seems long while we're going through it, but compared to eternity, it's over just like that. And beyond it lies the glory. In the hope of that glory, a Christian can endure anything that life brings to him. It sometimes happens that a man has to undergo a painful operation or treatment for some physical ailment or some disease, and he will accept and he will endure the pain and discomfort because of the promise of renewed strength and health that lies beyond. It is a basic fact of life that a person can endure almost anything as long as he or she has something to look forward to. As long as there is hope for tomorrow. As Christians, we have a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Christian looks forward to a great future. The last day, the second coming of Jesus Christ. Number two. We can get through the trials we're going through now when we remember what a trial is for. A Christian can endure the trials and hard places in life if they remember what a trial is, that it is, in fact, a test designed to make us purer and stronger. Before gold is pure, it has to be tested in the fire. You take the gold ore, you put it in the fire, it burns off all the dross, and what is left behind is pure gold. And the trials which come upon a person are designed to test our faith, to put it through the fire. And out of those trials, our faith should emerge stronger and purer than before. When an athlete trains for a competitive contest, he will work and he will strain and he will put himself through a tremendous trial and the physical ordeal is designed not to make him weaker, but to make him stronger and to give him physical endurance. You know what they say, don't you? No pain, no gain. In this world, as Christians, we are put through 
physical, emotional, spiritual trials. But if we remember that the test is designed not to rob us of our strength and make us weaker, but to build our character and make us stronger, then we will find it easier to face the trials when they come. In this regard, there's something even more suggestive in Peter's choice of words. He says that as Christians, we must be grieved by various kinds of trials. And I find that word various interesting because it's a word that means multicolored. There's all kinds of colors to the trials that you have to endure. Many of you are probably familiar with the word variegated, right? And variegated means multicolored. Now, Peter uses that word here when he describes our trials. Your trials are variegated. They come in all different shades. And he uses the same word in 1 Peter one other time. And the second time he used this word, he described the grace of God. In 1 Peter 4.10, Peter says that we're to be good stewards of God's variegated or multicolored grace. Our trials are multicolored. So is the grace of God. I find great comfort in the fact that for every shade of trial I have to go through, there is a corresponding shade of God's grace. All right, number three. Anticipate your reward. Anticipate your reward. A Christian can endure the various and grievous trials which come because of the reward that they bring. Peter says that trials test and purify our faith, which will result in an overflow of praise, honor, and glory when Jesus Christ appears. William Barclay writes again and again in this life, we make our biggest efforts and we do our best work, not for pay or for profit, but in order to see the light in someone's eyes and to hear their words of praise. These things mean more than anything else in the world. The Christian knows that if he endures, he will in the end hear his master say, well done, my good and faithful servant. So here is a recipe for endurance when life is hard and faith is tested. When we remember that glory lies behind them, that our trials have great value in purifying us and making us stronger, that they will result in receiving the praise of our Savior when he appears, we can get through them and we can even thank God for them. Now, Peter concludes this message with a word of commendation for these Christians who are enduring these trials for their faith in a Savior whom they have believed in, but whom they have never met. He says, though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him, you trust in him, and you are filled with inexpressible and glorious joy, for you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Peter, we know, had seen Jesus. He saw him as the man Jesus of Nazareth for three, three and a half years. And as the risen Christ for some 40 days after the resurrection, Peter is one of the first eyewitnesses. He and John 
were the first two to ever walk into the empty tomb. And he was there the evening of resurrection day when Christ came and appeared to his disciples. And yet these Christians, just like us, can know Jesus and trust Jesus and place our complete faith in him and love him and surrender to him without ever having laid eyes on him. We remember the words of Jesus to Thomas who claimed that he could not believe in Jesus as a risen Savior without seeing him with his own eyes. Jesus said, have you believed in me because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen, and yet they believe. So I want to ask you today, do you believe in Jesus? Can you say that you know him by faith? Can you say that you love him? That you are surrendered to his lordship over your life? We talked today about receiving Jesus into your heart. Have you been born again by the Spirit of God? Are you his child? Are you an heir to the heavenly inheritance? Can you say with absolute certainty of faith that you are going to receive the goal of your faith, which is the salvation of your soul? Well, I certainly hope so. But if not, You can be born again today. You can become a child of God today. You can come into your inheritance today by surrendering in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ. So let me pray for you. Let's pray together. Father, your word says, if today you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. I pray, God, that hearts are open and ready. That if there be anyone here in this room today who has never trusted Jesus as their Lord and Savior, never come to a cross and turn from their sin, and trusted in what you accomplished there on the cross, and believing in your resurrection, now have placed their faith completely in you and surrendered their lives to you, that that person today will say, today's my day. Today is my day to surrender completely in Jesus, to put my trust in him, to ask him to apply his salvation to me. And so, God, I am turning from my sin and turning to you for a salvation that you're providing that I didn't earn, that I can't deserve but I'm receiving as a gift, I'm coming to Jesus today. I'm placing my faith in him. And friend, if you will do that today, the Lord will save you. And he will begin a work in you. And he will put the Holy Spirit in your heart and in your life. And he will begin to change you from the inside. You don't have to wait until you clean yourself up good enough to come because that day will never happen. You come just as you are. And praise God, he doesn't leave us the way we are, but we, that's the only way we can come is just the way we are and say, Lord, uh, take this sorry sinner 
and make me into someone that you can put to work in your kingdom. And because Jesus died for me, from this day on for the rest of my life, I'm going to live for him. The Holy Spirit makes that possible. And so, Father, we thank you today, believing that you're going to work in hearts here today. And I know that most folks here in the room today are saved. That's why they're here. But if there's even one here today who's never truly trusted you, would you be speaking to their heart, drawing them to you, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord.